Love podcasts, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Joe podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. God, wow. The room is dead. No survivors. No survivors. <laughs> We've lost Eva and the rest of the crew. Yeah, Sean gone as well. Didn't even get a clap from Laura. And I don't think I could hear Ollie clapping then either. So nope. that's pretty rough. Yeah, it sucks. Um, Ed, I'm not going to call you Golden Boy. I'm going to call you 80% Dragon Boy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Hey, I'm good. Um, yeah, I, I've not been enjoying the influx of tuna <laughs> that people have been sending. Um, people were sending you tuna pics direct. Some, well, someone posted on the subreddit an image of tuna mm. which at sea at sea but, but that but prompted fear in me so i immediately hid that image and i really did consider blocking that <laughs> from the subreddit from the subreddit consider this a warning whoever that was i posted a video of a man hauling a ginormous tuna out of the ocean into our slack channel as well yeah you did that at three o'clock in the morning which i well, understand is because you were getting up for work at lbc but when i saw that i was like I was on a night out <laughs> and antagonizing <laughs> me. Sending me tuna picks. When did you um when did you open it? When did you see it? Must have been yeah, yesterday morning, maybe? Mm. This morning? No, okay. I, I I don't have slight notifications on my phone. That's what I'm getting at. Because so, I, I, when I posted it I thought this will be funny, I'll forget about it, and then on Monday morning I'll see it again yeah. and be like, fucking nice one. <laughs> <laughs> Great work from me. It's, a, it's an Easter egg. Yeah, exactly. A little treat. A time capsule of a joke. How was your that's the thing with most of my jokes, people get them sort of about five to ten years later. <laughs> I'm so ahead of my time. Yeah. Uh how was your bank holiday, Edward? It was very nice, very pleasant. What did you get up to? Uh what did I get up to? I went swimming yesterday in in a real liberal media bubble move, I went swimming in Hampstead Heath. Nice. Um, the pub quiz on Sunday and had a couple of birthdays on Saturday. My local um, natural swimming spot in Beckenham Place Park has recently reopened. Oh, great. Which I'm very excited about. Uh, is it like an actual pond or is it Lido? Uh, no, it's a pond. It's a man-made pond, but it's a pond no less. Um, they had to shut it because there was a toxic blue-green algae bloom. Oh, no. Which um, will fuck you up, apparently. Yeah, but it um, didn't sound good. There's also a ton of duck mites, which you don't get at Hampstead Heath, but like you come out. I, I've been a couple of times with um, a friend of the podcast, Josh Kaplan, and we go and then we get out and be like, why am I so itchy? And also, why is everyone else who swims here wearing a wetsuit? <laughs> <laughs> what do they know that we don't? Yeah, and answer, it's, the it's the duck mites, yeah, which is um, quite grim. What did you get up to? Uh, LBC. Uh, Maiden Voyage Festival on Sunday. So it's such different things. Yeah, <laughs> I went. So I different. went straight through. I did. I did LBC on the Sunday and then went to the festival, um, which was quite intense. Uh, and then Corsica Studios after that. Nice. So fairly large weekend. Yeah. To be quite honest with you. How, um, are you, how are you coping with your sleeping pattern being so disruptive? It's. I told myself it was fine, mm -hmm. and it is. I'll like, oh, fucking boohoo. You know, oh, oh no, oh, oh, my radio show on the radio. Ah. <laughs> um, but you don't, it, it, you don't feel it at the time. You're just, I don't know. It's like when you wake up to go to the airport or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. You're just like, this is fun. This is novel. Uh, it's the days after, so like this morning and to, and maybe tomorrow morning, um, because you've like completely fucked your circadian rhythm. You know, like your body is actually really, it's meant to fall asleep mm. at the same time and mm. wake up at the same time, roughly. And it's getting up for work on Monday and a Tuesday. The um, where you really feel it. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, thing. well, good news. You only have to do it again in two more days. Recently. Yes, exactly, <laughs> so. exactly. Now I've got a bit of time off. Now I'm going to a wedding this weekend. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm now into just a relentless, relentless spread, relentless run of weddings. I think I've got like three in the next four or five weeks. So. Who's who's subbing in? <laughs> what here? No, no. I, I, <laughs> no, we don't. I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> On everyone's favorite radio show, the Ollie yeah. Dugmore program. Yeah, of course. Um, it will probably be. I would expect. Um, Ali Mirage. Or um, maybe Marina Perkis, who does those does those slots, yeah. Yeah, the, bu the budget Ollie Dugmore, that's what people call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, famously, that is what they call them. Um, I think we're, we're talking about me a little bit too much. Can we should we do some politics? Yeah, well, you, you want to plug your show to... <laughs> they, really, they really told you to bump the listeners. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. The, th the thing is, so few people are listening between the hours of 4 and 7 a.m. that actually I'm driving the Paul Joe podcast listeners towards towards no, the radio If show. you really like Paul Joe, you will set an alarm and listen <laughs> to... <laughs> it's on catch-up. There's no excuse to miss it. There's no, there's no excuse. There's no excuse to miss it. Uh, did you not know that it was on catch-up? Have you not been listening and catching up? No, I've not. That's rude, isn't it? 
I spend enough like I, full disclosure. I spend enough time with you anyway, and here and talk to you like all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think in my leisure it'd be like right. No, right Ed, on go. your day off, six more <laughs> hours of dog more. <laughs> chew, fucking chew. <laughs> This is great. It's uh, you talking to mental people <laughs> isn't something <laughs> I'm dying to listen to at the weekend. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, b- both in a way masters masters of the craft, Ed, because you know you yourself enjoy going and talking. Not always mental people, but people who perhaps sometimes have slightly rogue opinions when you go out and yeah, you do your uh, yeah, your vox pops. So I think w- there is a yeah. I I was in. I do I do like seeing people the way people divulge. And for, I think I've spoken about this before, but people just are so happy to be asked their opinion and then just divulge really rogue opinions. I, I, I had a great one last week, which I, I think we need to warn the listeners <laughs> about the, uh, the incoming threat. <laughs> so I, went to, I was in Leicester asking people about immigration and I spoke to this man who, his name was Mick, and Mick said that he, that he was really against people crossing the channel in small boats and compared it to the Norman invasion, the Viking invasion, the Allied invasion <laughs> on the beaches of, of France, and said, this is an army, this is an army. But his, actual, his main concern was that the people crossing are actually going to be used to police 50-minute cities mm. that the New World Order are going Hell to Oh, yeah. Damn right, brother. So I think if you're, if you're, if you're not scared about the 50-minute city now, well, you need, to, you need to have a long, hard look in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Stay woke. Oh uh, no! Don't don't stay, <laughs> no, absolutely don't stay woke. No, stay woke to the threat of stay aware of the refugees uh, policing the fifteen-minute city. Stay stay woke to that fact. Do not be woke about anything else. No, never. No, no, don't ever be. Damn woke. right, damn right. Um, just as Rachel Reeves said, don't ever be woke. Don't ever be woke. <laughs> I don't think I think it's a misquote. <laughs> to be fair, sir. <laughs> no, but what she did say in the Sunday Telegraph this weekend was that Labour wouldn't tax wealth. No wealth tax. Crazy. What do you think about that, Edward? <laughs> I think I, I think I know what you're going to say, and it's going to be, "What is the point?" Yeah, of the no, I, th- I think it's that. I, th- I, I, I like it's. I think it's just like really disingenuous to. You're you're appealing to big business, mm. say, but I'm sure like businessmen are like th- they're behaving as if big businessmen are like, you know, in like 1920s communist cartoons of like big businessmen like are these big fat pigs yeah, yeah. like drinking money mm. you could quite easily rationalize a wealth tax to the wer- the wealthiest person in the world mm. and if they're a rational person which they, they might not be to be fair but i think it's really short-sighted to be like oh to appeal to big business don't worry we will never tax your wealth especially in like this current economic state and yeah. the problems that we face. Well, I think there's obviously, there's the obvious discrepancy, right, between the way that we tax labour, labour, and the way that, as in like phys- physical labour, mm-hmm. your labour, yeah, not yeah. the Labour Party, mm-hmm. um, and wealth, right? And there's a significant disparity between the two things. And essentially, as a percentage, proportionally, you, I, a retail worker, anyone else on a salary, as a proportion of your income, the tax you pay on that is far higher than anyone who it, makes their money instead via investment capital gains etc mm-hmm. and it's a it's an example of a one of several regressive parts of the tax system that punishes the PAYE employee and not the person who already has the capital and invest them and for me if the tax system is going to be properly re- redistributive which is the purpose of a tax system in my mind it is to create a fairer, more equitable society. That is an obvious place to start. I think large... Am I just kidding myself when I talk about the Labour Party in this way? I I see, I don't know, Keir Starmer committing to maintaining the Conservative fiscal rules for the first two years of a Labour government. I see Rachel Reeves going to the Telegraph and saying, there will be no wealth tax. Mm. And part of, and there's just a little bit of my rent's like, yeah, yeah, they don't mean it. They're just, <laughs> <laughs> they're, just, they're just saying that. They're just saying that so so those suckers will vote for them. You know, like like, like the way he lied to the Labour Party membership. <laughs> to get to, them to them. Yeah, to get them to he's vote for him. Consistently lying and he's actually just he's he's the he's like an FDR New Deal. Well no, Democrat, exactly. Like Exactly. And I don't I actually think it's really hard to know what a Keir Starmer um government will be like because of how 
uh, dishonest he is generally in, in, in the way that he lies. Interesting for me, I may have made this mis- distinction before, I think he's a far more calculated liar than a Boris Johnson, for example, mm. who, who nonetheless was calculated, but he also, the way he lied was more just kind of um, obfuscation, not being across detail, volume, volume bury you under a mountain mm. of lies. Whereas for me, the way that Keir Starmer lies is a far more calculated, um, specific and deliberate approach, i.e. the mistruths he told for the Labour membership to get elected by them, then reversing that policy programme almost entirely, moving towards a far more centrist, right-wing, um, Blairite-ish mm. policy programme. Again, is he doing that to gaslight the electorate? Because within recent memory, the only way the Labour Party can win an election is from the centre ground to then get into government and enforce like a really radical, and I think he's, he's more of a reformist, but nonetheless socially progressive ambitious policy program but for me that's like gold medal mental gymnastics Mm -hmm. yeah it's real corp it's real corp (laughs) to be like (laughs) yeah don't worry it's this government is still going to do good things i think it's it's when rich reason that interview talks about she doesn't have any plans for for government that a wealth tax would like would would be worth it for mm. as an say was it 12 billion it could raise something yeah. like that and like we don't have any plans to spend 12 billion pounds <laughs> like what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to do are yeah. you going to fix anything mm-hmm. where, where is that where is this mm-hmm. if you're going to if you if you're a proposition to the country which i suppose as a political party in opposition it should be it's mm. like we're going to make the country better what are you going to do are you just going to what is what is the plan rachel famously um that that Barack Obama campaign poster in 2008 it ju- it was his face right that kind of like pop art you remember mm. it you know what I'm talking mm. about and mm. then underneath it just said continuity <laughs> <laughs> just said nope. more of the same just said nope <laughs> no. nope <laughs> nope George W Bush has the right ideas <laughs> um, she also said in that in that conversation they had a few lines out of it that was one the other I think was about um, label loosening planning laws which I think is a good thing. Yeah. So it's like one hand bad, one hand good, you know. But what is but is one but is that also to be like to detract from the criticism of the wealth tax thing? Cuz that's like what if, what's the weighting? One is I think is one a lot more negative than the than the other is positive. Mm. Yeah, what, I what think are you gonna, how are you going to build those houses? Yeah, and it's not just about yeah, true. You well you need the money to to build yeah. them. <laughs> I mean for for me I think I've, I've um, spoken about this before, but you know the the sort of the net gain, the social good of let's say let's say it's house building, but it could be any policy program that you want to enact. You borrow or you tax whatever to raise the funds to do it, but the net benefit of let's say I don't know building the 4.3 million homes that the Centre for Cities has calculated we have a shortfall of com- when we compare house building over the last 13 years to our European neighbours. You do that, and then the social good that comes as a product of that vastly outweighs, yeah, okay, interest rates might be higher right now. So compared to the last, since 2008, what are we talking, 15 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it might be more expensive to borrow money now. But historically, it's still pretty low in terms of interest rates. We're still, we are still all collectively freaking out over single digit interest rates when it's been higher than that, for example, in the 80s. So it is more expensive than the immediate near past. But the social good of, for example, building 4 million high quality homes, the economic, but, but it's, and it's not just the economic, uh, let's talk about, I don't know, um, reduced crime rates, mm-hmm. um, better social cohesion, more family units, uh, the aggregate sense of community that develops, which has been deliberately or not atrophied and attacked in Britain over the last 13 years it, it for, I honestly think the finances of it are largely irrelevant mm-hmm. because the way that British society has collapsed not just under the Conservatives 
process that started under under Tony Blair, in in my mind, in sort of increasing incursions into civil into civil liberties, etc. Spend the money. Make Britain immeasurably better. I think it was um, Andy Haldane, who was a former chief economist at like the Bank of England, gave an interview to the New Statesman a couple of months ago, making this argument, and um, and basically said centrism and having like a Rizla paper between La- Labour and the Tories right now is so pot- potentially toxic for the country. Neither of them are being ambitious enough. No. And neither of them are radical enough. Look at Britain. Do we all agree that it needs transformational change? Mm-hmm. Yes. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, let's open a sure start centre. Like, yeah, I think I wonder. What, is it? I wonder if you say either party was to say Britain's pretty crap. We need to fix it. Mm. It's so easy for the other parties to then say they're they're doing Britain down. <laughs> like, look at all the food banks you operate. That's good, <laughs> isn't it? That was a big society coming together. Yeah, cheerful. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's I think there's that kind of there's for example. We talk about Richard Drax a lot on the podcast. Yeah, I think it's because he occupies quite a lot of like the <laughs> bandwidth inside your head. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest well, with um, you, I just keep bringing up I, Richard I Drax. Keep up, sorry, I keep talking. About, <laughs> I keep talking about Richard Drax in the podcast. But Richard Drax, the MP for South Dorset, Dorset, I, yeah. I think is the name of the constituency. So that contains the towns of Weymouth and Portland, which are basically pretty crap. Mm. They, they're there's a brain drain. There's not enough pool for young people is like an aging community younger people leave younger people leave and the um uh so there was a, a report written basically analyzing all the problems and saying we need cut and proposed some solutions as to as to um as to uh, remedy them and they talked about things like for example when the navy left the area it was the equivalent to like a coal mine shutting down in terms of industry because lots of industry was supported by Navy personnel there who like contribute to the local economy. Mm. When Richard Drax was told about the report or read the report, in his response he said that the authors of the report were t- trying to do Weymouth down, wasn't engaging with them. But but the the report was written from a place like I'm try I, we need to make Weymouth better. It wasn't mm. like a negative. It wasn't like just slagging off Weymouth for the sake of it. I, and I think as it's there is a risk of that. D- is is like a disin- disingenuous. Yeah, when it comes to criticism of the country, well, it, I, it feels like a Brexit hangover, right? Yeah, it feels like that anyone who offered a critique of Britain, whether it's its governance, mm. whether it's its, I don't know, cultural output, whatever it like, take take your fucking pick. Where the fact that our sports teams suck, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> you just need to believe. In Britain, you yeah. like you don't believe, and if if only you could see <laughs> the light, you 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 would be fine. And I think it's a product of that sort of increasingly um, partisan politics, the cheapening of of discourse. I I um I interviewed Zizek about it, like not too well. Actually, it was quite a long time ago now, probably several years ago. And he's, he's coming back, listeners. Don't you worry, he's coming back. And he said that for him. Patriotism involves critique mm. because to love your country is to want it to be better. It is not to say it is fragile, it is weak. And I don't know, to make it, let's say, I don't, to use, um, to like invoke Angela Merkel or like what happened with Germany when they accepted those one million refugees. It is not to say German culture is so weak, German society is so weak that if we accept these one million people, they will dilute mm. what it is to to have a German nation that comes from a place of fear and actually a lack of belief in your country. The patriotic answer to that criticism is to say, no, German society, first of all, is strong. Second of all, it will benefit from having these people here because it's not so weak as to be, you know, whatever the fuck diluted means anyway, Mm. that actually to be a true patriot is to be a critic of your country, which I found to be a, um, very insightful and moving piece of analysis. Very, and it, and it's retelling with equally as insightful. Fuck and off! <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> fuck yourself. <laughs> I don't think that warranted that. Well, you, uh, you're being rude to me. I, I wasn't you're, being rude. You're not taking the piss. No, 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 no I yeah, you were taking the piss. I knew you were taking the piss. No, I just like the phrase <laughs> insightful and moving. Yeah. Um, this is kind of apropos of nothing. Mm. I thought I had drop it the other day. 
I really like when you see a St. George's flag in like a civic environment. Right. In the case of like, I think it's quite easy to criticize. I think it's over like Southwark Town Hall or something. I think it's one over Brixton Town Hall as well. I think it's very important to take, or it's good when you take symbols of national identity that have been co-opted by the far right and put them into neutral mm. stuff. I think that's it's like important to demonstrate that Englishness and England isn't a symbol of wow. far right. Yeah, because I was, I was talking about I was talking to a Scottish friend about uh, about this, and he said he's quite nationalist leaning, and he said um, he he doesn't really like seeing the St George flag or the um, or the it's Union flag. Tire. But he said, but I said, do you feel the same about the saltire? He kind of was like, no, I don't actually. And so it's it's a for me, saltire, St George's Cross, infinitely superior to the Union Jack. Yeah, I think the Union Jack fucking sucks. I think as far as flags go, it, Wales, well, the Welsh but, flag yeah. has a fucking dragon on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me. You, I mean, look, <laughs> I know how you feel about yeah, dragons, absolutely. son. I don't, for, <laughs> from one dragon to dragons. another, game recognised game. No salmon. <laughs> Um, I feel like there is a national flag that has a fish on it. A national flag? Yeah, I'm going to pull that shit up. No way. Keep going. You just you just riff for a minute. Let me just riff this. for a minute about. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think. Well, I think because the union flag is artificial in that it's a union and it's kind of three flags that don't necessarily go together or complement each other. Mm. And but whereas well, I suppose they're all, they are all um, flags are all artificial or constructed. But I think people's sense of identity. Whether uh, as a, as a nation as opposed to British, I think people do feel a lot more Scottish or English or Welsh or Northern Irish or Irish than they do British. If that mm. makes sense, like that sense of national belonging is so much deeper and older than than British is. Mm-hmm. The national flag of Anguilla, British Overseas Territory, uh, has the coat of arms of Anguilla on a blue ensign with the British flag consisting of three dolphins in circular formation. Now, as we discussed last week, we know that dolphins aren't actually fish. You're fine with dolphins. Yeah, dolphins are grand. Okay. There's there's one, there's another one here. This is, this, nah, it's not in a country, it's a province. The flag of Shev, Shevenigan. It's got three silver herrings on it Ooh, with crowns. What's Shevenigan? It's an autonomous, no, it's a village, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a national flag. <laughs> There's anyway, a, there's a fish in the coat of arms of Glasgow. What is the Glaswegian coat of arms? It is a fish, a ring, a bird, and a tree. Because Saint Mungo, mm-hmm. the patron saint of Glasgow, mm-hmm. he God, performed miracles with all those things. There's a song about it. Tell me about the miracles. There was a oh, I don't know. There was a it, <laughs> here's here's the he made a tree grow that died here's the tree that never grew mm. here's the bird that never flew so i imagine he made like a lame bird fly great he made a fish swim that presumably That's couldn't swim a dead fish <laughs> i imagine was like right he made it alive again yeah and this this one is conjecture but something about a ring i think and he maybe the ring was in the fish okay we used to sing it in primary school yeah, but I can't remember what it. I, that's. Uh, do you have to renounce your Scottishness now because you didn't get that no, right? Just, glass, just my glass. Just, gl- just glass. Your glass uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This is what happens when you spend too long down the road in London. No, we're just saying we're outside of Glasgow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what happens. You lose <laughs> your heritage. Talking, you're not talking about St. Mungo. And Zizek would be gutted <laughs> about that. <laughs> Isn't it? This, this is also another observation. You know when you you don't live in or wherever you're from, wherever you're. Local you know where I'm from. Oh, sorry. No, you're talking generally. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever your local river is, mm. you think, oh, that's the that's the main river, like you know about the Thames. Yeah, but in but see, when I was younger, I was like, well, everyone knows that the River Clyde is the other main river. Mm. I imagine you just, you thought the Avon was a really prominent river. Uh, yeah, kind of, but that's because I got com- I thought that the Avon that goes to Bristol mm. is the Avon that Stratford is on. Right, but it's not. It's not there's two. There's there's tens. That's There's tens of because it's uh, Avon in Old English. Mm-hmm. It means river. Oh. <laughs> 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 so there's um. And no one ventured outside like ten miles around their yeah. home, so there was no reason to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, everywhere, everywhere that has a river, Avon, it's river, river. 
and there are there are a few other words also like that which i cannot remember which again it's the same so there's there's like nearly 100 rivers in britain whose names when translated literally mean river 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 depending on like the local you know the localized dialect or language that was spoken there so i imagine there's probably like a celt equivalent um maybe i've got it maybe i've got it wrong and avon is the celtish word but yeah um so no i did i did think that the avon was like pretty big cheese when it came to rivers actually it's fucking irrelevant um it's not the one that goes to bristol i mean i think because of the shakespeare connection as well you like i had an inflated yeah. sense of importance of where stratford on avon is uh -huh. and then moving to london and people and then me realizing that i had to say stratford on avon because when you tell someone down here that you're from stratford they look at you and go what like where westfield is <laughs> you grew up in the west <laughs> yeah i grew up in a west Georgia. um nadine dory's ed yes pour one out fuck me she's gone long may she rest that took that's a good time she's a good time too long she, it's actually it's quite admirable you, sh you have to weigh up decisions like that mm. you shouldn't rush into oh for sure leaving a job mm. always you need to properly weigh up your options mm -hmm. and uh, or start another one in the meantime yes true actually <laughs> is start presenting your talk tv show beforehand <laughs> make sure you've got something really yeah, it's yeah. quite funny she gave like was it she gave like an exclusive interview to talk tv um but at the time, yeah, when she had, when she resigned, when she, she resigned but didn't resign. No, I think she gave one, gave one when she. I thought the announcement was in the mail. It was, yeah. but, I think like, but then she spoke about it to Talk TV. I think right, okay. Which always makes me laugh when they're like, it's like when footballers give exclusive interviews to their like to the club, club, the club YouTube account. channel. Yeah, it's like, and it's like, tell me why you're so great, Ed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. God, you did so well today. Yeah, I think we should do more of them actually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that can be like the hundredth episode. Yeah. I'll interview you. Uh -huh and ask you why you're so amazing look i mean um she had nadine doris had not made a verb she's not made a verbal contribution in the house of commons for more than a year the last time she gave a written answer was when she laid down a statement i think in september 2022 in the handover between like johnson and trust mm -hmm. she has not voted in the house of commons since april she no longer lives in her constituency uh she has not held physical surgeries in her constituency uh, and all this entire time where I think you would look at those five things and go well Nadine Dorries is no longer acting yep. as an MP she has continued to draw her salary the entire time the other two who resigned Boris Johnson and Nigel Evans at the time that she said said she was resigning but didn't actually resign they've had by-elections she's I think waited until this weekend to do this because it means the by-election will fall on the Thursday, immediately before the Conservative Party conference. I think the entire Ooh. the entire thing is deliberately intended to politically harm Rishi Sunak. Yeah, like it's just it's it, it, for for me encapsulates everything that is fucking rotten about Westminster. Like forget political representation, forget access to politics. Like being able to talk to your MP about an issue or reading their resignation letter because not <laughs> so this is a slight tangent she didn't like um you know the, the typ typical way is write the letter to the prime minister it will eventually get a load to the government website you'll also tweet a photo mm -hmm. of it whatever no she gave it to the the, the mail yeah they put it on mail plus which is behind a paywall so and and actually it turns out i don't think she actually wrote it to the prime minister so she like didn't send it to him so <laughs> initially the only way yeah. you would have known that nadine dorries was resigning is if you're a mail plus subscriber um and so it's like all these things are a fucking game to these people. Yeah. It's my my representation of Mid Bedfordshire is irrelevant. I am just going to use this to harm Rishi Sunak. Like, how fucking pathetic is that? Yeah, I think it's it's also I think the people it's very easy to talk about this and people have been talking about this as like a Westminster parlor game almost. So like the rivalry between conservative factions. Mm. But there's actually it's like a democratic deficit of the, for the people in her constituency who haven't had a functional MP. 100%. Imagine you had someone who had a really urgent need for from assistance for your MP. Mm. You can't go to any other MP because they're not allowed to take on your casework. Mm -hmm. As, imagine that like, you had like, a genuine like issue, yeah. something you needed urgent help with. And she's just fanning around on the telly. Well, the Flitic um, parish councillors yes. like, turned against it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, meant to, they're kind of apolitical, right? They're sort of like they're, it's not like a local council, right? It's not. Um, they're not like Labour or Tory, right? They're, oh, really? They're, uh, they're local people. Okay. Local people. <laughs> <laughs> local local councillors for local on. people. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, they like turned turned on her mm. and were like, "Get rid." Um, yeah, shocking, utterly shocking. And it's, but nothing's going to change. As in, it's not going mm. to be like. I, th- I think part. I think the it's such. A, I, just, I just think Westminster stuff is so. It's, there's like an immaturity to it. Like Nadine Doris is in her sixties, has had a professional career. Don't know. She's a very successful author, you know that. No, I know that, but that's so. Oh, she, <laughs> <laughs> she also um, the like half of the resignation letter was like her promo of her upcoming expose. Oh yeah, that would like, be funny. The deep set, uh, the deep state you, is like my, taking down. I, Boris I've Johnson. realized that my work as an MP is incompatible with my upcoming book, which is available at all good <laughs> bookshops for a very reasonable price. Yeah. Even that, that's how you shouldn't be able to, uh, to promote your other work in your resignation letter. <laughs> that's a, that, you try and stop her. But also, uh, it's just, it's just quite embarrassing massively oh something else i thought was really revealing in that letter one of the final lines was um it was like you've ava- you've abandoned the fundamental principles of conservatism which i found really interesting because right dory's is the diehard boris johnson mm-hmm. you know, like diehard boris johnson that's what all of this is about first of all um the backstabbing of him by rishi and other Tory politicians. She can't believe that they turned on him. And then his blockage of her peerage that Johnson wanted to give her. That's what, what all of this has, you know, started, came out, happened because Boris Johnson, for me, not your archetypal conservative. Mm-hmm. Socially liberal, as mayor of London, back to immigration, very pro gay rights. Um, I don't think, I don't think anyone really sincerely believed that he was a supporter of Brexit. He was sort of, chance your arm, see which one happens, follow the political expediency. I think if you were to compare, and then uh, very interventionist, right, in terms of the economy, high tax, um, at least the language of levelling up was pretty, although I suppose you could probably cast that in sort of the paternalistic, um, sort of more old school Toryism, but let's we don't need to go into a fucking ideological discussion about that. Rishi Sunak, conversely, incredibly socially conservative, yeah. banning um, fucking laughing gas. Mm-hmm. Uh, not what you, Suella Bravan when she said that shit about like Pakistani men like abusing oh, like, white girls rape, like rape gangs or something. yeah 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 um, he had no problem mm-hmm. with with that uh, it, bl- using the blocking the Scottish government's attempt to make self ID easier yeah. I don't think that was naked politics he genuinely yeah. you know has a problem with trans rights mm-hmm. he re- and then there's the stuff around schools as well um, that he's trying to do with Kemi Badenoch and also changing the Equality Act to focus on specifically quote biological sex rather than um, again in, in terms of self ID mm-hmm. I think socially incredibly conservative fiscally incredibly conservative there's a question about he's, he's also a Thatcherite and so there's a question actually of whether you could describe Margaret Thatcher as a conservative or not I think you know a neoliberal etc is probably slightly more relevant anyway to say Rishi Sunak is not a conservative for me boggles the mind because yep. I think he's the most conservative prime minister we've had well at least since Thatcher mm. well let's also look, look at his cabinet like mm. look at the company he keeps like they're not proud of him if you were if you weren't a conservative would you have some of the most right wing prominent conservative MPs in your cabinet or not mm. just talk about like a rivalry between like Braverman's camp mm-hmm. and Sunak's maybe they're in the same camp <laughs> of, of like it's <laughs> Yeah, would would you, would you put one of an, a rival you disagreed with as Home Secretary? She, she, it, it allows him to pass the buck of these seeming of quite unpleasant decisions. Mm. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, it's his responsibility as well. Everyone in cabinet yeah, is yeah, responsible yeah. for all the decisions that the, yeah. the government makes. Look, there is that there is that collective responsibility, but there's also um, that I pe- again what we're talking about there the racism of British Pakistanis or the, the frankly like atrocious atrocious shit. In relation to refugees and small boats, you know, he he's the prime minister. Like she is saying and doing those things with his blessing. You know, he's been invited to disavow her remarks mm-hmm. on multiple occasions. He never has. Yeah, it's because it's yeah, it's politically expedient to have her make them because she's the one who then draws the flag mm-hmm. for them. But he sincerely agrees with her. Yeah. If 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 there was a different home secretary, do we think the home secretary would be more more kind to refugees? No. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's. He's the, he's the architect of his government, and mm. it's. Mm. I, I think it's a real. It, it really it's. I find it quite infuriating when you see a profile of Rishi Sunak talking about like, oh, he's like a competent 
technocratic bro. Is it? No, he's not. He's a very right, right yeah. wing person at the head of a very right wing government. He gives off the vibe of being socially progressive, I think, partially because of the Silicon Valley thing. Mm -hmm. I think partially and incorrectly, people go, oh, he's an ethnic minority, yep. therefore he will have liberal attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat bizarrely as well, because of the contest with Liz Truss, where everyone thought that Liz Truss was Thatcher remade, and therefore Rishi Sunak was like a fairly like woolly, yep. cuddly, nice, liberal Tory. Rishi Sunak has been... He's he's a paid up Brexiteer, right? Yeah, yeah. Liz Truss was fuck had a fucking Damascene conversion after mm. the, after the referendum result, but yet somehow she managed to position herself as the more right wing of the two. Yeah, peculiar, very peculiar. Uh, Ulez, yes, a little bit of Ulez Ed. You win some, you les some. Happy Ulez Day. Happy Ulez Day to all who celebrate. To all those who enjoy breathing. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I think it rolled out today. No, first day. Yeah, yeah. Delicious, delicious. Cl the, the air tastes cleaner already. <laughs> You're Edwards. in central London. I saw, um, as I was, as I was uh, on my way in this morning, there was uh, a poster. Uh, you know, like, um, it's, it's LBC, actually. You know, they have the digital hoardings that will have, like, news yes. headlines, right? And it was um, Sadiq Khan's controversial ULES scheme rolls out today. And I, I thought, like, hmm, forgive me if I'm wrong, but... Isn't it something like 60% of the population, of the population of London, supports mm -hmm. ULES? But to describe it as controversial is controversial. Yes. I think the, I think the, 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 um, the outrage, the debate around it, for me, it's confected. It's, it's, it's a media storm. Mm -hmm. It's not an actual person storm because people are like, nitrogen dioxide causes chronic lung health yep. conditions. I don't want my kids to ingest too much nitrogen dioxide. Therefore, let's have a little bit of ULES. We bit of ULES. We ULES. It's also, it doesn't affect most people. Yeah, correct. 90%, is it 90% of cars? Meet, you already meet the standards? Mm -hmm. So, half of, half of Londoners don't own a car. Yeah, <laughs> it's, also people, <laughs> yeah. That's just like, I think, um, yes. Was it, was it, it was like every pediatrician backs it. Yeah. Because they don't want kids to die of lung disease. <laughs> That, do you know what? That is a disgusting, that is, disgusting is political my position. God to take. given right to make to tape my child's mouth to an exhaust. <laughs> <laughs> and Suck on it, Timmy! <laughs> I'm, fucking, I don't, I'm, taking, I'm taking out my Catholic converter. Mm. It's gone. It's Throw gone. it away. You're, Throw I'm it putting, away, brother. I'm putting a brick on that accelerator. Amen. And you've got Amen. Hose pipe. Down. Haze pipe from the exhaust pipe into my house permanently. It's just on. You've got to build up. A tolerance mm -mm. to it. That's the way to answer to it. You have to have mm, yummy, yummy, like yummy, 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 Delicious. <laughs> yummy, 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 yummy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's also, it, it's good. good. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's 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 difficult, isn't it? Because, yeah, people with these old diesel cars, it is going to be a problem. I know people that it's, that it's a problem for. Um, like it sucks, and the scrappage scheme is not going to cover it. Mm. Business owners, you know, people who, for example, I don't know, have like run a couple of vans for work are really going to str struggle and show me a fucking nice little run around van that you could get for two grand. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's bollocks. It is tough. Sort of pick your poison. Do you know what I mean? Makes it harder for you to get around, makes it harder for you to live. Yeah, fine. I think there could be exemptions actually for workers like that. I mean, I'm not. I'm pretty open to sort of widespread pedestrianisation of central London. Mm -hmm. it's, you get access for like buses, taxis, trades. You know, so you get you get a permit basically yeah. to fucking drive your van around there. I don't think anyone needs to drive a private car no. in, into central London. No, I agree. If you get, like once you get the zone three. If that, oh, oh, now you're talking. Coming from, well, I mentioned South London, I mm. suppose. It's quite, it's more difficult to get around. Yeah. But like, Central London especially, like, if you, why do you need to drive into Soho? Yeah, I mean, what that's you mental. Yeah, or like, Oxford Street. It's literally prob probably one of the best connected places in the country. Oh, the, the? there? Was, yeah, there was a really interesting... You, you probably um, get there from any point in the country. There was a really interesting John Byrne Murdoch graph. I mean, always, they're always interesting. Um, I think it was over the weekend. Looking at, public transport 
in European cities, how, so it's sort of basically on average, I think it was, if a French city has about 150,000 people in mm -hmm. it, it will have its own tram network. And if you look at somewhere like Leeds in Britain, which I think has a population of about 600,000 people and has no discernible tram network. And it's, it's like, first of all, our cities are actually really bad at, at accepting sort of high volume of car traffic because yep. they're quite old, the geography of them, the sort of the road planning, it's not designed for cars because all, the, all, the, all of these places predate the existence of the motor engine. But then simultaneously as well, as well as being terrible for cars, you know, whether it is not enough car parking space, um, not enough dual carriageways, not enough sort of direct friendly routes. You know how in an, an American city, for example, you will be able to get the freeway like literally yeah. into the center of town, mm -hmm. right? And then you pull off into downtown where all the skyscrapers are. We don't have anything like that here. But then simultaneously, the public transport also fucking sucks yeah, yeah, yeah. and is completely underdeveloped. So you just end up in this sort of like horrible helter skelter world where everyone's driving, but you end up with shitloads of traffic because it doesn't work properly. Yeah. Tell you what that what would help with that a wealth tax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we, we could find the. I'm not opposed. Country. I think you know. I think there's a re I think there's a, a really potentially politically successful political program that is just like insane boosterism, like what Johnson was doing, but 10x. Yeah. Like, wreck the planning laws. Just burn them. Mm -hmm. Just be like, fuck it, it's free mm -hmm. for all. It's, it's party time, boys. Put up a fucking skyscraper <laughs> in the green belt. Like, there's nothing near it, but put a, sky a skyscraper there. Build me 10 reservoirs. Put a motorway that crisscrosses the west to east of this country. Let's put a few more up in the highlands as well, even though no one will use them. Let's just fucking chuck some motorways down up there. Let's um, finish H HS2, then also send, like, let's say another couple hundred more miles of high-speed rail all around the country. Like, full-on infrastructure. Go ballistic and stimulate the economy. Someone, someone made a point about um, the power of Thatcherism in the 80s it can be shown by them building the city of London airport. Oh, okay. Because it's in zone two. Mm. Imagine now being like, airport, zone two. You, you could never do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it also probably isn't, that's probably also not great for, <laughs> for air quality, <laughs> but they bloody did it. <laughs> yeah, they did, yeah. Fuck the air quality. We've got a full pivot on this, haven't we? Well, we're now back to, <laughs> we need another airport in London. <laughs> Every city centre, airport. There was that, um, I can't remember the name of the substack, so it's slightly unfair, but um, in the sight of the unwise, the guy was like, you could win an election tomorrow on the policy program of every single woman in the country, uh, every single mother in the country gets to give birth in a private room on a ward. So, oh, rather, yeah. oh. so rather than, you know, shared wards, etc., colossal hospital building program, mm -hmm. like um, neonatal units, more midwives, etc. It was like, you could win an election on that promise alone. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably slightly, slightly, slightly reductive, but for example, let's build a shitload of uh, of these of these of these wards. Why not? Like stimulate the economy. They're doing it in the states. They're doing it in the EU. I'm fucking I'm fucking down for it. Instead, we sit here and we go, wow. Um, the mayor of London wants us to ingest less nitrogen dioxide. He's what evil. what a cunt! Yeah. Wow, we are living in <laughs> dictator cans yeah. economy. What a piece of shit! What yeah. a absolute horrible bastard! That's reminded me of Cheems as well. Oh yeah. We didn't do our minute silence at the beginning of the episode. No. Would you like to do one now? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, probably not a particularly great listen. Is it just a minute silence? Or we could do it. Or we just edit it out. Okay. We were just silent for a minute. Yeah, I know. I'm real. <laughs> Respectfully. I mean, a real one. A real loss to the community. Um, Luis Rubiales, Edward. Yes. First of all, first, let's get our ducks in a row. What a piece of shit. Yeah, what well, a horrible bastard. <laughs> and what a weird mum he has. Oh, yeah. Tell people about Luis Rubiales' mum, the president of the Spanish uh, Football Association. This, this man who planted a big old wet one on the lips of Jenny Hermoso. Um, he's been suspended now, but his mum, she's not happy about it, is she, Edward? No, and she's taking refuge in a church in Spain and is on a hunger strike, which is an insane reaction. Like, what, what was she doing in protest before that? She went straight to hunger strike. Yeah. Do you reckon she'll starve herself? No. I, think she, I don't <laughs> think she really reckons <laughs> what hunger strike's going to do to her. Yeah, because I mean, the investigation's probably going to take, what, at least like a couple of weeks. Yeah, he's right. not going to resign either he did the whole like I'm not fucking leaving I'm not fucking leaving did you watch the speech yes yeah no. I've forgotten the Spanish but he's like no no boy uh, remitan is That's, that the word is I, that I, I, don't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know the right word but anyway it was like weird he's like he tries to do the whole cancel culture thing 
he was like, I'm, this is a social assassination. Uh -huh. um, this is a social assassination. I'm the subject of a witch hunt. Uh, yada, yada, yada. And then like starts shouting repeatedly, I will not resign. I will not resign. I will not resign. And then they applaud him. Yep. Because people love bald men getting away with <laughs> sexual kissing assault. women. Yeah. That was, the, that, that was the thing, actually. The, the camera pans around at the applause, right? And the fucking creep head coach, yeah. he's applauding. Yeah. Which is, uh, for me, basic basic man management, basic woman management. You know, and I don't mean that in like a gender way. I mean, <laughs> uh -huh. in like the sporting sense. Like, you know, if one of your players thinks they've been sexually assaulted, don't applaud the abuser. No, it's, you know? it's, probably, it's probably not good for team harmony. Yeah, I and think it, the morale in the dressing room has probably suffered and, a little bit because of that. And they're all now refusing to play against yeah. unless um, Rubial like, is... Mm -hmm. Goes. Goes. Yeah. The few women that were in the audience, they did not applaud him. No. no. Surprisingly. Um, it's, I mean, it's just sexual assault. And it, was, and it was on television. It was live on television. That's the thing about, like, the argument about cancel culture is obviously bollocks, and he knows it's bollocks. Mm. The thing about cancel culture... I think when, just, when someone says, oh, they're trying to cancel me, it's for something a lot, a lot more like nebulous. Mm -hmm. It's about like, oh, I'm saying the wrong things about trans people say. But I think it, like, even if you're against cancel culture, you can, you can agree that sexual assault is something that... Sexually assaulting one of your colleagues yeah. in the workplace. Well, that is grounds for dismissal. With, a million, more, with millions of people watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is grounds for dismissal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it, it's, it, is, it is sexual assault. Mm -hmm. It is. It doesn't matter. I don't know. Fucking that you just won the World Cup. It's not an excuse. She, mm -hmm. she doesn't consent. It's like it's unwanted sexual contact. Like yeah, that is what it is in the letter of the law. F and I think that actually the political context of of what's happening in Spain is also really relevant, right? You've got the the rise of the far right in Spain, like pretty dramatic. I think they're polling about twenty five percent now. Mm -hmm. This is very much. And I'm not so. And to be clear, you know, I'm not saying that like Rubiales is like you know uh, some kind of like political candidate or anything like that. But the the sort of the discourse and the conversation in Spain, you are like this is this is sort of like a um a fucking microcosm for that conflict between socially liberal, progressive yep. feminists mm -hmm. versus the kind of the nastier side of far right politics that that presumably a lot of those lads are pretty comfortable and happy with the president of that federation lip sync some lip sync a female player as Oh, it should be his God-given right to be able to be able to neck <laughs> any one of the eleven players in that uh, team whenever he likes, um, and then sort of more rational, sensible people saying, "No, the legal definition of sexual assault is unwanted physical contact, sexual mm -hmm. contact, and that is what you have done, sir." So, hand in your badge and your gun, mm -hmm. and never fucking disgrace us with your presence again. Oh, it's really, it's just embarrassing it's mm. just an embarrassment for spanish football mm. it's like spanish women's team achieves the ultimate accomplishment in sport and the whole thing's been overshadowed by his entitlement that marina hyde column was prescient in ways mm. that, <laughs> that i think we didn't even expect because she was talking about the greenwood thing right yeah she was talking about how don't underestimate the ability of like greenwood but also the manchester united executives and uh footballers more generally to detract At attention um, detract from the achievements of the women's team to suck all the oxygen out of the debate and make it about mm -hmm. his um, transgressions well fucking Mr. Rubiales has blown Mason Greenwood out of the water but actually I think the two of them taking the two of them together is really important right because you have the biggest club in the world just fucking chronically getting getting that absolutely mm -hmm. wrong I mean they were in, their, in their statement when they said he was leaving they repeated his claim that he'd been cleared of all charges yeah. right which he hasn't. He the, the the prosecution collapsed. That's that's a very important distinction. And then you have probably, possibly, no, certainly one of the most successful football federations in the world. Mm -hmm. The one in Spain. Yep. Enormously successful. The national team, the the domestic league. Yep. Both of them, and these these so in theory, at the height of the game, you know, the most serious organisations of the game. Of Virtue setting example for no, all other well, all other football. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, they should they should be. But mm. how about just being able to fucking recognise sexual assault and say, "Sorry, mate, you don't work for us anymore." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, um, an, it's an HR issue more I, than anything. I'm not asking them to be like patron saints of fucking feminism and like footballing virtue. Yeah. I would just accept them being like the most basic minimum standard of like competent HR professionals. Good people. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just fucking decent people. Yeah. I don't know if I think football's super run for that. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think football is... I don't think football is run by good people. I don't think good people... I don't think football has the interests of good people at heart. Well, no, it's money, right? It's money. Of course it yeah. is. I think, I think it's so... I think it's sad. I think it's, I think it's pretty gutting for mm. football fans that, that it's... The football is so short-sighted and it's so beholden to commercial interests that they can't just do the right thing. Mm. And it requires, you know, fan pressure groups. Well, think about in the case of United. United wanted to join the Super League mm-hmm. two years ago and it was fan pressure that stopped it. Yeah. And so, so it just shows that the custodians of football at like the highest level just aren't interested in preserving it for the good of the game. Well, it'll be the commercial considerations around Greenwood as well that I think probably did for it rather than, you know, any sort of sense of what's morally right or not. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Because um, they, they, completely, they completely, it's so hypocritical. If they, if they planned to, the reporting suggests they planned to bring back Greenwood and they only changed their mind. So they can't take any moral, they can't t- claim any moral superiority on the issue mm. or any it, it's gr- so grubby yeah I think that's and that's actually one of the things that I liked I do like most about the women's game is that it is yet to be corrupted by the sort of colo- infl- co- influx of colossal amounts of money that mm. that's happened in the men's game you know when um, we had like Viv Miedema on Unfiltered right mm. talking to her she was so frank and honest and open she, you, you hadn't no impression that she was moderating what she was saying because of concerns about, I don't know, collapsing a fucking deal with Nike mm-hmm. or, you know, some kind of front cover of a magazine shoot, whatever. No, it's just, this is what I think, so I'm going to tell you. And admittedly, I don't think all players are like that. I think she's admired because she is so frank. But you don't get a, you don't get an interview with, with a male player where they're like, FIFA and UEFA are breaking our bodies. Yep. To make money, mm-hmm. like they don't care about the players, they care about making money. You wouldn't get like Jack Grealish is not saying that. No, do you know what I mean? And no, he's no. held up as like an example of a footballer with a personality. I mean, he's not yeah. necessarily like as a, a fucking thinker, but <laughs> 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 but you know he's what? Like I, a Croy figure, <laughs> <laughs> like Pep Guardiola. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you know what I mean, though, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think even like Jack Grealish, like oh, everyone loves Jack Grealish, Jack the Lad, mm. King of England, <laughs> and he's supporting Benjamin Mendy. Yeah. Yeah, it's who's um was it on Depay's Instagram yeah, post where they're like on there comments? That's another example of it, right? Yeah. And they're all like, "Yeah, so happy for you, bro." Oh, you know, this is great. Cleared of all the charges. It's just the most celebrating it, like celebrating him being cleared of what six or seven rape charges, mm-hmm. as if it, as if he's won like a like the League Cup or something. Yeah, so I'm so happy for you, bro. Like facetiming him. I think they have like a um yeah, Pogba did that, didn't he? He posted mm. that screenshot of the FaceTime. I think um I think footballers have this sense of being like constantly persecuted constantly under attack and admittedly you know some of the shit that the tabloids do to them is you know completely unfounded like oh look at the house Raheem Sterling bought for his mum you Mm -hmm. know disgusting or whatever you know so ostentatious Mm -hmm. or you know getting criticised harshly for the way they play sometimes being racially abused on the pitch um, by the fans you know homophobic abuse all of that Mm -hmm. I understand why they feel like they're sort of a bit of a siege mentality, but that does not excuse sort of celebrating someone being cleared of a rape charge. No. Like... You shouldn't even know the view. <laughs> you shouldn't have to say that. Yeah, I know. Ugh. It, bo- it kind of boggles the mind, really, doesn't yeah, it, actually? Yeah, they're adults. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Oh. This has been quite a sad episode. Yeah, it's not been good. <laughs> it's been quite but sad. But the podcast itself is not good. I don't no. know. I think it's, it's quite de- it's quite depressing. Yeah, that's for sure. If if Jack Grealish became the face of a wealth tax, though, that would be You're really trying to trying <laughs> to hammer actually, those two things together. I actually think oh, you could never get a professional footballer. Well, oh, yeah, be, obviously. Why would they do that? <laughs> yeah, I think there's some, like young people with a ton of money. I think are probably some of the most like Thatcherite people mm. tr- to be like. There's no, this is my money. I've no I've no concept of the social good. Molly Mayhag. Yeah, like something 20, like that. Twenty-four like, hours in a day, like baby. KSI, but KSI like would hate the idea of a wealth tax. Out of the side men, who do you think is the most right wing? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's. I think. I think they probably all are. Yeah. I think. Well, I, th- I think it is a case of side men, right wing, beta squad, socialist. No, right wing as well. Mm. I think. I think genuinely, like every YouTuber, young. If you come up, at age say sixteen, and you're a millionaire. And then you suddenly get taxed. You're like, 
what the f- you like I don't think you're mature enough to handle that responsibility. Mm. Like obviously I'm a millionaire as well. But I I only came Yeah, look man, as a YouTuber, as a content, <laughs> as a YouTuber as a content, a content creator, what do you think about a wealth tax ed? I'm very for it. But that's cuz I went I went that's cuz I went to university. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think like if if you are like if you're taking that was a, a very uh, that could be taken out of context. I've been criticised for saying people who think go to university aren't clever, which is not what I'm saying. Mm. I'm making a joke, but I think um, I like your jokes best when you have to qualify them. <laughs> yeah, no, I, saw, uh, I suddenly got cancellation. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suddenly got quite worried. But I th- I think there is a phenomenon amongst like say you were nine. I think I think is you would object as a nineteen year old to being a millionaire and the government takes half your money. Mm. I think, and you'd come up with quite creative solutions as to not be. Mm. I think one YouTuber said, he was doing like a Q&A and he was like, you might have been Cal Freezy. He said something like, so how much money did you earn last year? And he said, on paper, 50K, like grinning. <laughs> and then he's got like, he'll be making tons mm. off the off the bat. I think, I think there's a, a real, Children of Thatcher element to being in to being a YouTuber. Is he Sidemen or Beat Squad? Neither. Is he not? No. I thought he was in one of them. No. I think he's just friends with them. Just hangs out. Just hangs out. Well, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna be hanging out with them anytime no, soon. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be quite that'd be quite that's a shame. I was looking forward to I don't know. Hanging out with them at their houses. In the content house. In their content house. Hmm. Um what do you think? Do you think do you think they're right wing? I don't know or care. That's fair. <laughs> I actually do. I actually do think it's quite important. Okay, go on. I actually do think the politics of them is quite important uh-huh. because they make so much content. They're so big, and their audience is so young mm. that people, when they t- if they talked about a political issue, I do think a lot of young people would take it really seriously mm. and to take their advice really seriously. What do you think we're doing here? Well, I think we're qualified to. I, I think I think there's a difference between us as professional journalists speak for yourself discussing, <laughs> <laughs> discussing issues but we're also well informed yeah but like if you hear, if you listen to like their podcast and it comes up with like a political issue they don't know the facts and then they repeat something about how um it's it's also well say like a wealth tax would genuinely affect them mm. so if they were really against the wealth tax you'd get all like sidemen children coming mm. out against the wealth tax <laughs> which wouldn't affect them in a million years yeah 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 yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. So, radicalise the side men. Yeah. I think I genuinely would be a really good good thing for, like, if there was, like, a social democratic YouTuber. Mm. Like, a massive one. Like, Logan Paul. <laughs> 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 Became a socialist then. Mm. Or, if there, or if there was, like, a British Hassan Piker. Yeah. But I don't think there is. It's probably a H-bomber guy. Yeah, but he's not like household name. I only really know who he is because you like him. He's fucking massive. But how, like, how, but how massive? Two, three million subs, I think. Okay, but I don't think that. But he's not influencing like debates. No. There's not like articles written about him when he does things. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Should we leave it there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> comment which side man you'd like to come on the <laughs> podcast. I can probably get Nico. He's not a side man. No, we were talking about their man beta squad. Oh, sorry. Okay, could you? Yeah. Sick. I interviewed him like five or six years ago when he gave um, like a load of EDL racists heat oh, activated t-shirts yeah, yeah. that make that came up and said I think they did Saint George was Turkish or something. <laughs> that was good. That is funny. He's, that was, he's, he's, he was doing shit like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Quite funny, I think. Yeah. You can come on. I think we might, we might be a bit too small time for him. I think we might be. Mm. Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> Molly May will be on next week. <laughs> that would be good. Um, thanks very much, guys. See you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye.